sometimes people do a lot of jerky movements. We don't want that. What is the amount of force that the band produce? The band produces the force which is equivalent to the percentage of elongation. The other two products are constants. That's the material of the band that is going to remain constant, the cross-sectional area of the band that is going to remain constant for all the patients. So the force that with the, which the patient is going to produce is maximum at 25 to 250% elongation of the band. It is mid-range. What is the color of TheraBand that I would use? Most people make a mistake over here. A uh, lot of times they do not prescribe the right band. Sometimes it is too heavy for the patient to begin exercising with. We need to understand the age of the patient, the job domain that the patient is into. Is the patient post-operative? Depending upon that, we would select the color of the band. Ideally in our setup over here, we use a red color band for females and a green color band for males, unless they need to return back to sports and then we would change the color of the band, prop up progressively. Most companies have different color codes, but uh, the company that uh, is explained over here, I would go as tan, yellow, red, green, blue, black. So depending upon the company, the progression of the band is different. Approximately the difference between two bands is mainly upon the material the thickness of the material and is about 25% increase in strength per level. What should be the length of the band that we are using? Most bands that we buy in the markets are about 1.5 meters in length. So sometimes the patient would tell us how much distance should I use? Should I just use a part of the band? Should I use the entire band? What is the ideal level of length that I should be using for my exercises? So my so my answer would be the length of the band to begin with is the length of the lever arm or the part that is going to move. That's the lever arm. That is the ideal length of the band that we are going to use. So if I'm going to work on my supraspinatus, my length of the band would be till my We also have to understand that as the joint angle increases, the force angle decreases. And that is why, how do I connect the band that is optimal? How do I connect the band that it is going to work the best for me? What angle should it be? Is it going to be in neutral? Should I put it at 35 degrees? Should I put it beyond that? We need to understand that the band has to be in line with our axis of rotation. The band has to be placed in such a way that when we are at the end range of the motion, when the band force is going to increase, the force angle is least. Because as we know, our muscles are weaker in end range. They're best and optimally working in mid range. How do I connect the band to my body? There are a lot of techniques that we can use. Most commonly used technique for our cases of shoulders, what we would do is ask the patient to tie the band above the wrist rather than holding it in the palm so that we can avoid trick deviations that the patient would do. So suppose if I want to train my rhomboids, I'm going to do this. I'm, I don't want to have my patient just deviate the arm and trick me on that, tied on the wrist so that they can't fool us. The another most commonly used grip is the foot loop. These are the most common exercises that we would do with the patient with the TheraBand for training the scapular muscles and the rotator cuff muscles. We need to uh, make the patient aware of what is right, what is wrong, what can go wrong. So our most important exercises over here are the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus training. We need to tell the patient that these exercises should be performed with optimal muscle force, but you have to be very careful that your body is erect. Do not lean forwards. Do not lean backwards. Most of the times the patient would trick us by bending down, binding on the side, just arching their back. We need to tell them that while you're doing the supraspinatus, see to it that your elbow is straight. See to it that you don't cross beyond 45 degrees. We don't want you to go up all the way through. Stop. You are in the plane of scaption. Do not hold your neck tight. Do not 
uh, hold your breath. So these are a few don'ts that the patient needs to do. We would ideally have the patient do them in front of the mirror. So again, they have their own feedback. Tactile cueing all the time to the patient, our hands behind the scapula. We have to tell them that the scapula needs to be braced, well kept in that position and only then would you lift your arm further. It is very important that the scapula is stabilized, is set correctly before they move their arm. When we're talking of the infraspinatus, the most common mistake that the patient would do, especially when they go back to the home program, is that they would tie the band at any angle. We need to tell them that the angle needs to be correct. As mentioned in the uh, line over here, you would ask the patient to use a towel roll over here. Most importantly, we have to see to it that the shoulder and elbow are in line. They have to be careful that the elbow and shoulder are not all the way over there. They are in line in this position and then take their hands out. That's the bear hug exercise that we would do for serratus anterior and subscap. Subscap, as Sir mentioned, we, is not given to all the patients and it's saved only for a certain set of patients where you slap or where the subscap is affected. Stretches. So when would I have my patient do the stretches? Adhesive capsulitis, yes, I would ask my patient to do the stretches. But when? Even on day one, would I ask my patient to do the stretches? No. I would work on the scapula, I would work on the core, I would work on my rotator cuff, and then I would simultaneously start my stretches now. You have to see to it that the patient doesn't push too much. A lot of times, a uh, lot of therapists do a lot of overpressure. They want to just get the range. They feel we are going to do it in one or two sessions. No, that's not right. We do not want you to overstretch. Sleeper, sleeper stretches are something that we first start with. Explain the patient. They can be done as a self-stretch program. The patient knows where to stop, when to start. Each stretch should be held for about 15 digital seconds to be repeated three times. The posterior capsule stretch, the interior capsule stretch, and the inferior capsule stretch. So when our patients want to return back to sports, is this enough of what we've just talked about? No. Patients who want to return back to sports need to do much more than this. They need to go back to the set of exercises which are multi-axial. They need to do exercises which are multifunctional. Go back to plyometrics, perform exercises on an unstable surface. We could also simulate the stroke or the shot that they are going to use in their sport. We can add to the lever arm by adding the sport gear in their hands. So these are the D1, D2 flexion extension patterns and simulating the forehand and the backhand stroke that they would use in tennis. It is also very important to assess and maximize on the entire kinetic chain before the patient returns back to sport. We all know our body is one kinetic change and the force generation is starting from the legs to the back and then passed on to the shoulder. So if any component over here is going to be weak, the maximum output that we want on our shoulder, the velocity with which they are going to throw the ball or the action, all of those are going to be dependent upon a lot of forces that they are going to develop from their legs and their trunk. Post-operative protocol, again, would differ in cases of uh, a rotator cuff as against to, to our uh, replacements, our reverse replacements, talking about cuff uh, first. We would, I'm sorry. Our patients would start a program on day one. Till day three, they are very protected. They are in the sling. We are going to ask, uh, sorry, till week three, they're going to be very protected. They're going to be within the sling. So ask them to move on their fingers, wrist, and elbow. Ask them to do pendular exercises in all the three planes. Shoulder bracing is started at this point of time. A lot of times we give them table wash exercises. Third week onwards, we give a little more leeway to the exercises. They can start with active assisted range of motion exercises, but we have to be very careful 
and we have to really tell them very strongly that do not go beyond 90 degrees. We do not want to put our repaired structure at jeopardy. We also start with static deltoid muscle work. Anterior, middle and posterior fibers are started. The patient can do the exercises at home. They need not come to the therapist every day at this point of time. Six weeks onwards, when the patient is free to move the arm, we ask the patient to come down to the clinic and a supervised program is done. In this case, we eventually shift our base from scapular stabilization exercises to core to cuff strengthening exercises with TheraBand. We need to be careful, as I mentioned, in replacement cases, there are no stretches that are to be given. In case of reverse replacement, where the biomechanics is different, we need to do a different protocol over here. We follow the cuff substitution protocol where the supraspinatus is not going to be effective anymore, and we need to strengthen deltoids. So we work on anterior, middle, and posterior fibers of deltoid. Thank you. Thank you, Manski. Right. Thank you, Manski. Thank you. The last talk is fairly brief uh, because this is largely related to the surgeons. And so we are going to try not to repeat because most of what has to be said has been said. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to raise a lot more questions than answers because we are discussing stuff that has not been discussed before and we are crossing over. We are trying to teach fundamentals to, of physiotherapy to surgeons and vice versa. But uh, hopefully this is a good start. Um, I keep reiterating that uh, these muscles, the rotator cuff is not easy. Just because a surgeon has sent a patient to a therapist and don't expect that the supraspine is going to come out strong. And even in our practice, after diligently working on PSRP for over 20 years, we have 15, 20% patients who just do not respond to the rehab. And there are multiple issues there. But they have to dig deeper, pick out all the instructions that Mansi has suggested as with her experience, she has made a subtle point of where to tie the band, which band to select. So similarly, you have to create the situation that creates a milieu that will facilitate the rotator cuff to strengthen. And that you can assess as a surgeon to test it and tell the physiotherapist and give that feedback. A few things that I want to touch on these topics, and there are very few really on this topic, is fibromyalgia. There is no entity like fibromyalgia. And you really need to look up a definition of fibromyalgia. You will not find one. The best definition of fibromyalgia I got was from Harrison's textbook of medicine. Believe me, yes. And it, it said that it's a condition of inflammation of muscles after having ruled out all other allied conditions. So uh, it's a very vague definition, but we'll come to tell you what is, why is it that patients have these soft tissue problems and pain scenarios on these patients? So we'll discuss that. I will not leave you unguarded on these patients. Uh, we have discussed structure versus functional. I think a lot of us <clears throat> on the therapy side and the surgeon side should ensure that we know what a condition is. And if it is functional, leave it to the therapist. And if it is not, and if it's structural, then only then ask for an MRI or a similar condition. If we start asking for MRIs for all conditions, then we are going to get too many false positives that the MRI is reported a partial cuff tear, and most often than not, it is always a false positive. So we would send patients for MRI only once we suspect that there's a structural lesion or substantial tear that needs addressing. So it's important to understand this. Uh, because the supra and infra are so demanding, you have to ensure that you have a dialogue with your therapist to ensure are they bracing the shoulder? Are they using the right color band? If there is too much pain, then can we reduce the band to a lower level? Is there too much elevation? And often patients will do it perfectly in the presence of our therapist, but they go home and they don't understand the importance and they start doing it fast. 
they start doing it hard. So the gym exercise they're used to are really hard exercise. You're going to push them. Whereas PSRP is a exercise program that has to be done in a very slow, tedious manner. And it's about the slow return to normal. It is that eccentric control that provides much better strength. That is what we tell them that the therapy and gym exercise are much too different. I have explained already about the subscap, but Kibler has suggested that doing isolated cuff exercise is not enough. You need to combine rotational or plyometric programs. Now, not possible to do that in the early instance. So when the patient is early, what we would do is do them slow, do isolated muscle exercises, stabilize the scapula first. And when they reach a certain level, then you introduce the plyometric or the D1, D2 programs to then get the muscle memory working. And that is the whole trick. The entire purpose of the PSRP is not only to bring that head of humerus in the center of the glenoid, but it's also about cognition between the brain telling the muscles in a feed forward mechanism to fire in the right sequence. Now that comes with muscle memory and that comes with practice, that comes with slow repetition of things. And if the patient is able to duplicate that, then the PSRP program works quite well. This is very important. We, we give a lot of credit to Ben Kibler. Aaron Skiaskia, his therapist came to us on the 25th PSRP program two years back. And we had a great two day session or probably one of the best PSRP training programs that we've had. So why are we investing so much in the scapula? Because the scapula moves in a coordinated fashion with the humerus. When it doesn't, that's your six scapula syndrome. That's when the scapula has gone ill. That is important to understand. And that's why the foundation has to be treated first. The humerus will be treated later. Entirely keep the instant center of rotation in the safe zone. Now the safe zone for the acetabulum is very large and it is very confining. Whereas the safe zone for the glenoid on a minuscule glenoid is very narrow. And that's why it requires great amount of precision from the therapist to ensure. So because that head is subluxed out, it's instant center of rotation, not in the position, it creates problems. And the reason it creates problem is often uh, we'll have a mismatch between the force couples because they're not able to exert their best of their strengths. The rotator cuff, when it's optimally functioning, it will automatically bring the center of rotation into the uh, center of the glenoid. How do you know that? There are patients you're working on seven, eight, 10 days and nothing is happening. And the 10th day, the patient says, oh, suddenly I'm better today. So there's no magic on the 10th day. What happened was the therapist managed to bring the head into the center of rotation. Once it comes into the center of rotation, the cuff automatically kicks in because the therapist has facilitated the correct length tension relationship between the scapular humeral muscles. We know from laws of physiology that a stretched muscle is a dysfunctional muscle. It cannot fire. And that is what's happening. One muscle group is tight. One muscle group is lax. They are not optimally functioning. If your therapist is smart enough to understand the 3D mechanics and bring it back to its home position, the cuff starts firing immediately. They're able to stabilize the shoulder. And that day, suddenly the patient tells you that for the first eight days, nothing was happening. Suddenly eight days, I started becoming better. She's amazing. So that's how you optimize the cuff tension. Very important paper, Kibler reported the five common causes of scapular dyskinesia and five causes of pain due to scapular dyskinesia. AC joint pain is very common. If you have AC joint pain and there is no arthritis there, look into the scapula, very commonly you find the scapula dyskinesia. And the sad fact is that most of us will not strip the patient to evaluate the scapula. And that's why we are going to miss out on this feature. So a shoulder patient, make it a habit, remove the shirt, look at him from behind and check. There is always some amount of scapular dyskinesia. My contention is suppose there's a long thread signal palsy, patient will complain of impingement and surgeons have missed it in the past purely because the shirt was not removed. So please do that. Coracoid pain is traction tendinopathy of the pec minor. And the pec minor is one of the muscles that spoils it. The two muscles that we hate as therapists in the shoulder is the upper traps and the pec minor. And it just pulls the shoulders together and creates that impingement position. So be careful that. Subacron pain in the cordman point is typical external impingement. And that's again, very commonly because scapular sliding down the ellipsoid thorax that I explained previously. 
superior medial scapular pain that is very commonly labeled as fibromyalgia is because of traction tendinopathy of the levator so if you are able to pull the shoulder back into position get the scapula in home position the stretch on the levator is resolved the pec minor is stretched out the levator is tightened back again that pain will disappear there's no point logic or reason to inject that tender point because you are not treating the causal pathology you are treating the symptom not the root cause and all the thoracic outlet syndromes where you have tingling numbness in the arms don't start scrapping for mris for these patient on cervical spine you will find nothing these are typical posture related thoracic outlet syndrome we have discussed the functional versus surgery the point i'm trying to this enormous evidence in literature about home rehab simple rehab uh, giving far superior results than arthroscopic subacromial decompression and acromioplasty as a surgeon who understands shoulder biomechanics i tend never to do an isolated subacromial decompression acromioplasty because we have a great team of therapists who are able to restore function on those patients you could do that in conjunction with your cuff repair to facilitate the cuff repair as such now i'm coming to a very important aspect that i want to draw your attention to and that is called as the pidd proximal inadequacy leading to distal decompensation this is not mentioned in any book this is inspired by yanda this terminology is our technology in short it means to simplify and translate english into english it means the victims and culprits approach which means that just because there was coracoid pain here and i ended up giving a steroid injection or i ended up doing arthroscopic subacromial decompression to relieve the pain the pain was relieved and it recurred again after 3 years or 1 year or whatever because i was treating the victim the culprit was the scapula so here as i said let's invest in treating the causal pathology and so i'm going to share some of our expression where we've been successful in treating many conditions just because a pain is here on the tennis elbow doesn't mean that you need to address the elbow invariably 99.99% of the cases that tennis elbow pain is coming because of a weak infraspinatus because the wrist extensor is the best substitute for external rotation when a patient cannot reach out in external rotation he is going to hyper extend the wrist and that repetitive use over months or years will create tennis elbow the patient will tell you ki during covid era kaam wali bai didn't come i had to do a lot of bartan magna and cleaning the house but that's just the pretext wo kawa dali pe baitha aur dali toot gayi dali pehle se hi kachchi thi so it is understanding the kinetic chain we keep talking about kinetic chain ad nauseum but we don't apply it in science the kinetic chain is where the power comes from the lower limb different segments that facilitate transfer of that power to the distal segments in a uniform optimal manner the kinetic chain and the core harmonizes the transfer of power to distal segment so if the proximal segment is weak the distal segment is going to overuse in order that the distal segment performs in the most optimal way the proximal segment has to be best that's why if you realize we have invested in the proximal segment more than the distal segment that's why we do a lot of core exercise that's why i'm talking to you about scapula 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 because that will facilitate uh, restoration of the distal segment so to cut a long chase short weaker vein stenosynovitis uh, trigger fingers tennis elbows are all treated with our psrp program we ignore the tennis elbow we give them tennis elbow stretches but that's just part of the treatment and in which case when they come back in two weeks time which is the phase 1 supervised we will demonstrate strength in the infraspinatus the tennis elbow pain will be 10% less but their infraspinatus strength will be 50% better then they do this at home for 6 weeks and 8 weeks later they are 100% better on tennis elbow and the shoulder and cross my heart in the last 13 years we started this in 2007 i have not given a single injection for tennis elbow as such because our therapists are capable of getting this in so i have explained you the tennis elbow ideology the same can be applied to flat foot hallux valgus and similar things where you invest in the gluteus medius and then get your foot contact better so we do the same on this side so what appears may not be so this is a 
young lady, IT professional. She had a lot of scapular and neck pain. And you on the video on the left, you can see she's unable to balance with a flex knee on a single leg. Because her core is absolutely poor, she was shocked that she never tried this and she just couldn't. And just after two weeks, after supervised PSRP, which involved a lot of core strengthening, she could do that for a whole one minute without issues, smiling, and that has helped her neck pain go away. So there are a lot of practical uh, applications and results in applying in this fashion. So we love you know, exploring different segments to ensure what is going wrong in a given patient. And so it's important to combine a core rehab program along with a scapular program. A lot of this reading comes from Yanda approach. I told you, your flat foot, your patellofemoral compression syndromes, tibialis posterior in action, tendo Achilles tendinopathy. We treat with a proximal training program of core and gluteus medius, similarly on the shoulder. The book is quite complicated, but he's an amazing gentleman. He's a neurophysician who gave us. Finishing off uh, frozen shoulder, I think the number of patients that I see, a very small percentage of those are genuine frozen shoulders. A lot of them are rotator cuff tendinosis. That genuine patient of frozen shoulder can be defined with somebody who has a zero, 10 degrees of external rotation, zero degrees of internal rotation, and then the rest doesn't matter how much power flexion abduction he has. But he has to have a very tight rotator interval along with a very, very stiff rotation. He, he might have a very good forward flexion, but the rotation is zero. That would be a true frozen shoulder. In the absence of osteoarthritis, in the absence of proximal humerus malunion, in the absence of tumors. Because these three conditions can also create a similar situation. Then it's not a true frozen shoulder. And so most of the patients that we treat are weak rotator cuffs because of dysfunction, the functional problem, not the structural problem. And so they should be treated by a rehabilitation. The uh, thumb rule that exists in our uh, academics is that leave it alone, it will improve by itself. I did rather have a patient improve because we intervene rather than have nature take the credit for improve. The other thing is that if you and Mark that, don't worry, Babulkar, it will take one year and it will get better. I can't live with a disability for one year. It will ruin my rehab program. It will ruin my exercise program. It will ruin all the calisthenics that I do. And it will keep me away from my job as an arthroscopist to hold in there. So we have to conspire in such a manner that we have to get that patient back to normal in the shortest time, most efficient way, without an invasive procedure. And that is why we need a structured rehab program. So there is no point doing all this inordinately because it is just not going to work. That's why these are very difficult patient treat. They need a specialist therapist. And we as clinicians should monitor every two weeks, every four weeks that there is an improvement in range of movement, pain, and strength of the supra and infrasign. If that is happening every three weeks, then I'm not worried. Then I'm very sanguine about this fact that let alone you're in good hands is going to improve. But if you have one month and six weeks passing and your movement and things are still stiff, dig deeper and find out what is going wrong. So in short, the PSRP program is largely neuromuscular. That is what you understand. It is not about wild strengthening of any muscle. Any aggressive strengthening of an individual muscle is going to cause more problems, more pain. For the first two weeks, it is a supervised program, half an hour every day, alternatively, six days, twice a day. They have to be 40, 50% better in all those three parameters. Then they go to a six weeks home program, end of two months, they should be good in function, range of movement, strength, and pain. And that should be monitored. Briefly, we had come up with a lot of debate about why use bands and why not use free weights. So this is a study by Phil Page from USA. And it's a very interesting study. All of us understand the strength duration curve. And we know that the muscle is strongest in the mid range. So all our exercises must be designed in such a manner that the peak strength is offered in mid range. So if I'm doing a biceps exercise, then I don't want maximum strength in this position. I don't want maximum resistance in this position. The maximum resistance should be in the mid range position. That is how we have to design the exercise. That is how PSRP is designed. And the logic for that, if you look at the first graph, 
you see that this is oh, oh. something has happened here so sorry your powerpoint got uh, off switched off oh it crashed really ah oh. that is the first i've never faced that we are at the last three slides uh, i'll try and get keynote to work on this so here we are okay so this is fill page study if you look at the graph on the top oh huh? not happy that is strange i don't think zoom and apple get along <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay, let's try one attempt. If it works, good for me. Otherwise, I'll just do an oral transfer. Uh, you stop share or re uh, re re share? Uh, you stop it share. Should, it should work. I'm still sharing. No, you stop it again. Okay. 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 And share right. It. right. 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 And have you faced this problem, Raghu? It is the first that I face. So the point I was trying to make was on those three graphs, uh, you see when the free weights are used, there's a lot of erratic uh, signal. Where there's a peak loading in the in the top graph here, there's peak loading initially, and there's uh, mid range. It is coming in reasonably well, and at the end range, it is matching. No, the arrow doesn't work. Uh, never mind. Okay. Um, I will continue continue okay. just this way. Uh, there are just a few points that i wanted to make so it's only with the therabands that you will see i'll just do a stop share and then we can just talk on the screen yeah it's only with the exercise bands that the mid range peak strength will be achieved and that is how it should be number one number two with the pulleys if you do the same graph there is a lot of resistance in the initial period before the mid range is achieved and on the later stage after the mid range there is very poor Uh, resistance offered so it's very erratic it is staccato kind of thing and that's not good for the joint we must design an exercise which peaks in mid range and that is why mansi described the exercise in the manner uh, lastly i need to cover couple of points number one was the thrower's paradox the thrower's paradox is interesting where in a glenohumeral joint especially in an athlete it is required for the athlete for the shoulder to move in extreme movements for the head of humerus to slide translate rotate at peak velocity to impart that velocity to the ball at the same time the paradox is that the humerus has to remain stable to provide a fulcrum so that there is not an excessive movement of the head of humerus over the glenoid while is doing this when the athlete is performing at his peak level the soft tissue envelope around the shoulder is being challenged at every throw and it's been loaded at levels that are approaching almost the ultimate failure level so when it's reaching the ultimate failure load you can imagine that every throw that player is vulnerable to injury that is why it is important to assess the player ensure that the scapula is not missing out although they are reaching that threshold it's important to keep them there so the athlete is a much more different animal to treat than a conventional patient lastly i had some evidence on early versus late uh, rehab we are great proponents of early rehab we avoid the sling even after surgery and this is pertaining to arthroscopic rotator cuff repair and we are great proponents of early mobilization i think the sling is my enemy because it promotes that shoulder to go into that frozen shoulder situation tightening and adhesions of the rotator interval is there evidence for that yeah. well there's evidence both ways so we compared articles and studies on both way the one of the best studies was lisa gallet she is amazing she has done a lot of work on rehabilitation and by speeding up the rehab you are facilitating the collagen fibers to heal and strengthen along the lines of stress and that is why when they come out of that they will be much more stronger they will be less vulnerable vulnerable to retear and will improve faster now proponents like juan hu who published his paper about this uh, about a slow progress on rotator cuffs he is of the school of thought that we must not load the rotator cuff easily early because it's a very tenuous structure healing into the bone is difficult and that is understood 
So at the end of one year, Joanu says that your and my patients are both going to the same. I understand that. I appreciate that. But I did rather get my patient early, faster, pain-free because I am putting myself in the position of the patient. I empathize with that patient. So if you are going to operate me, then give me an early rehab program because I will rehabilitate myself faster and not have pain and disability for a long time. There's a small chance that I will increase the chance of a retail. But that was the nice study that I wanted to present between Leela Garrett, where she compared all the uh, meta-analysis and found out that by doing an accelerated rehab program, you will increase your retail rate by 1.26%. Which means that by going slow, I am disenfranchising 98.72 patients. So I did rather invest in those 98% patients, give them a faster rehab, and then perhaps one patient might retire. I don't think my retire rate has gone that high just because we're accelerated and we've been doing this for 19, 20 years. So that's why I'm a great proponent. If you don't want to rehab them faster, leave them free, discard the sling, let them keep their arms in neutral. And our repairs are huge, they're strong. The materials that we're using, the anchors that we're using, the sutures, are incredibly stronger than what was done 20 years back. We are doing double door repairs. We are doing exceptionally strong repairs. And we are still using policies of rehabilitation designed 20 years back when they're using um, drill holes through the humerus, earthy bond sutures, which were more likely to fail. So that's why we need to move up and level up with the technology. And I have never regretted doing that. Uh, so these are the points that I wanted to cover from the surgeon's perspective. I might have missed out one or two points here and there because of this. But I think by and large, what I wanted to tell you was the principles on rehabilitation, understanding and minimizing our use of analgesics and steroid injections, maximizing our use of exercise-based rehabilitation, not generic physiotherapy modality-based. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I have cleared some doubts. I hope I've introduced a lot more thought process there and got you thinking. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, I think I agree totally with your last point on the cuff repair post-op rehab regime, which was designed when there was a very inferior uh, level of anchors, PDS sutures on a metallic anchor, but now we have robust device to repair. Yeah. Yeah. much more mechanical strength than the native rotator cuff uh, being put on exam on the regular movement of the shoulder. So I have been keeping like a free arm after the cuff repair on a pillow support, keeping it free and allowing right. Right. I haven't seen much or significant repair at all. Uh, now, I think it's very highly important to focus our attention on this core scapular shoulder. That's the yes. key message. The core muscles keep the scapula in place and the scapula will allow the glenohumeral joint to be stable and moving in the same direction. So all these three work synchronously. One dysfunction might lead to the other overcompensating. So that has to be picked up preoperatively. Uh, Kapil, uh, Shashank, comments, questions? Ashish, can I just pick up on one we are point very quickly? Minutes, but we can I know we've had this. Minutes. Sorry? Yes, Kapil, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Go on. Ashish, I'm just going to pick up on one point and think you and I have had, you know, a discussion in private about this as well, is the use of steroid injections. And I do understand your views from what you say that you want to address the underlying pathology. But what we have found, of course, we don't have the ideal recipe of rehab. And I think you're very blessed to have that ideal recipe of rehab where you've worked all the ingredients to deliver that high quality dish that your final product. Others are probably not as blessed as that. So we still tend to use the injections, not as maybe a treatment in, on its own, but as an adjunct to relieve the pain because what we found in at least in our system is because the chronicity of the disease, that pain is a big inhibitor for patients to engage in the yes. program we have. Yes. Hmm. And so just for a general message, I think we need to clarify that injections are still have got a place, not as treatment, but as an adjunct to facilitate yes. what our physiotherapy colleagues can do then. I think you've raised a very valid point. There are two issues that I need to tell you. Uh, 
we are lucky and the difference between england america and india is that we have no faith in our patients so we don't do the twice a week rehabilitation that you practice there and then allow the patient to do that at home so that allows us to get the physiotherapist hands on and get a better result the inflammation in the shoulder is a disincentive you are absolutely right and you cannot rehabilitate patients in the presence of pain what the steroid does is resolves that inflammation whenever there's inflammation proprioception reduces and that's why it's impossible to rehabilitate them what the steroid does and some patients take the steroid injection they are like boss my uncle move on because their proprioception has restored their force couples are restored so if you can use the steroid as an adjunct and that's the very important operative word unfortunately in india surgeons use the steroid injection as a therapy you take one injection come back next month i'll give you the second injection that's not on so in my unit it's not that i have not used steroid injections i do so when i send a patient to my therapist and they say that doc this is difficult they are in too much pain they are unable to cooperate so third day they will send it to me i would then give them the steroid injection to facilitate the exercises so the right thing ethical thing to do is to give the steroid injection and start the exercises and that is what works the injection in isolation is a you know you're shooting in the dark so totally agree that is what the point i was trying to make is the use yes. of injection as an adjunct yeah yeah yes sir yeah Ashish, uh, uh, this is Ashish as well as uh, Mansi. I think Mansi, you are muted. If you can unmute yourself. Um, so you mentioned uh, in the initial uh, first examination, you look for the posture as well as the posture. Um, uh, you mentioned about posture. What you look at? How do you check for posture? And how do you quantify it? How do you document posture? That it is a weak posture and poor. How do you compare it from the first day to the fifteenth day? Yeah. Mansi, you are better qualified than me. <laughs> I'll take that. Uh, so for the first day, talking about the uh, uh, documenting about the core strength. Unfortunately, we do not have kinetic in devices in our clubs. Most of our private clinics, we rely on the way we see the patient. Mm -hmm. We would ask. I'm sorry, I I can't make out what she's saying. Ask the patient to recruit the muscle for the position. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes. It says on my screen I'm muted. My... No, no, no. You are okay. Okay. You're okay. Go on. Okay. We yeah. can hear you. So what I would do is put the patient first in supine. Look at the local segment. I would put my hands right next to the ASIS. Ask the patient to take a deep breath. See whether the patient is able to do a local segmental control. Feel for the transverse abdominis. Is he able to activate it there? S move on to more standing positions. Put the patient on a single leg uh, stand position, like what Sir had just demonstrated. Ask the patient to stand. Look for any deviations in the hip. Is one side of the hip falling down? Is the patient able to hold? well but unfortunately to document there is not one uh, we also have the biofeedback device which i use a lot of times in my clinic put the biofeedback device ask the patient we have a, a regulator on top of it which has markers on it is the able is the patient able to hold on to the marker or is he dropping into the red zone or the orange zone is he maintaining himself in the green zone most of the times that is not a problem now we have cubicles where we can take the patients we have mirrors around the clinic ask the patient to see themselves we have mirrors front back sideways ask them to see themselves are they able to understand what their posture is do they appreciate any alteration in the posture you show them what is faulty on you and then you correct that and show them what is ideal give them a lot of kinesthetic awareness give a lot of tactile cueing to them guide them through the right ideal position hold the scapula behind hold it for them like what we have this scapula assistant test and the scapula retraction test do it with them 
do they understand that if they are able to do that or they are not able to do that yes sasha uh, <coughs> one question it is uh, most of uh, still what how uh, whatever uh, ex uh, explanation we give it is subjective and it is not quantitative is it right not quantify we are unable you to you can quantify. quantify it but it's tedious there are devices Uh, Kibler has mentioned the coracoid to anterior acromion distance, but it doesn't work out. The posture you can compare somebody who has a temporary posture who self uh, improves after a injury after three weeks. Somebody who has to be intervened. That's the intermediate tight posture where there's a pec minor stretch which can be corrected. And the others are the fixed ones who have kyphosis who are never going to correct. Yeah. Now somebody. who loses his posture over 20 years because of a kyphoscoliosis is compensated they have not had a problem for 20 years and the body has had time to adapt the lent tension muscles have had time to adapt somebody who becomes a poor posture within a few weeks or a few months those are the difficult ones because the muscles not have not had time to compensate for that or adapt to that those are the ones who give us a severe problem ragu Yes, sir. We could also measure Manse, one question to both uh, Mansi and Dr. Ashish. Uh, using the uh, therabands, you said that B1 and B2 exercises. How to simultaneously do the scapular stabilizing along with supraspinal tension? That I couldn't get it. Interesting. So what I would do is I would. brace i would hold that position a therapist would actually give them a feedback with their hands that you need to brace you need to put that inferior angle right there down hold it over there and then gradually lift your hand up most of the times in the clinic we are supervising we are assisting them we are trying to give them a tactile cue right here hold on to the inferior angle of the scapula keep them braced keep them kissing keep both the scapula Together, and then gradually lift your arm up, holding the scapulas behind. Okay. The other Ashish, thing, Ashish, Ashish, Ragu, you do in different. Ragu. Ragu. Yeah. yeah. No, no. These are part of our team. But one, you must understand, the D one, D two exercises are for phase three. D one, D two. I do this. So the patient has invested in phase one. We have gone through the scapular stabilization and more. If somebody has an unstable scapula or a six scapula. they are not eligible for d1 d2 or the phase 3 program and that comes through dissociation stabilization all you need is a tactile feedback in the phase 1 you don't need to hard press the scapula if you just keep your finger in and do a obrans you will suddenly realize that the positive obran became negative that's just a tactile feedback that you need but all that is done in phase 1 the d1 d2 is only after 6 8 10 yeah. weeks after phase 1 second the uh, uh, second technical tip is that if you have problem Sitting or standing, you can make the patient lie down so that they, yes. there is some support for the scapula, so that there be less compensation from the scapula side when they lift yeah. up anterior. Okay, lie yes. down on a hard floor. Yes, yes, firm, firm floor or a hard right. floor. So you yeah. give a uh, stabilization, then you can do lift up. It won't compensate much. Kapil, <coughs> yeah, I'm just going to make a point. As she said, you know, we don't have the. i think you you over credited our patients being very clever that they can do this exercise at home without supervision the bottom line is that we don't have the resources that you have that we can see all these patients so the simplest thing that i've used in you can call it modified feedback or biofeedback or a uh, poor man's choice is that when we give them these exercises i'll try and tell them to do those exercises standing against a wall and make sure that their scapula yeah. remains in yeah. contact with the wall all through that the phase that's right so that's their kind of their bio feedback bio cue whatever they're getting but also in the clinic yes. as you discussed before as well the moment you get them to do that themselves and their elevation improves you put it in their brain that they can control it and they don't need someone else to do it for them so Absolutely. you know as we, about the cognitive it, feedback that they're going to have yeah you know we've discussed that before that your patients come to you not wanting an operation my patients come to me wanting an operation so we are working on different things to get to the achieve the same thing yes, yes. i have to convince them that they can do it and i don't need to get my knife out the interesting thing that kapil prompted out and let me translate that from his scottish english to indian english is that 
by and large, and this message is going out loudly to all the therapists. If something is not working, just blindly go back to the scapula. Invariably, eight exactly. out of ten times, it's the scapula that has not been addressed. Exactly. However, however strong you are, if you're standing on quicksand or a vibrating platform, you will, your your body will not be strong. So you have to realize that. If yeah. you've got a wobbly scapula, you can do anything and things are not going to work. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Yes, Vivek. I think I shared a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, case, which uh, I took the cue from Dr. Kapil. A uh, few months back, I had shared one, uh, you know, a case in our shoulder group where the girl was having a very funny, acute onset of instability of the shoulder. And, you know, she could just, in one particular moment, she was just dislocating. And uh, she got her, uh, she was from South Africa, the sister of one of our uh, resident. And uh, there they did MRI and they said, you need immediate surgery in Johannesburg or somewhere. Then she came down to Dubai and there also somebody said, you need immediate surgery. So this guy was not very sure. My resident, he said, no, you come down to Manipal. And when I examined, I could not find because it was a just a kind of a, you know, relatively very short duration, not traumatic instability. So, and there was nothing in MRI. We repeated MRI with Atma our institution and we could not find nothing. And there, Dr. Kapil told me, he privately messaged me, he said, what you do, you ask her to stand on a single stance yes. and then do the same thing. And this just disappeared. And that's yes. what exactly yes. probably Mansi was trying to tell that how, you know, the the single oh. stance, how the core once is stable, yes. it, it just changes everything. And she, now yes. it's a four month rehab. It's almost 90%, Kapil said, it's almost 90% gone. She's there almost go. normal. So, she, you know, with our physiotherapy, we have a very advanced center now. So she's in direct touch with them. And she still sometimes yeah. feels uncomfortable, but I said you yeah, have yeah. to do it for an year almost and you'll be, yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's called as the corkscrew test. Yes. Okay. I, I have I also had name. a okay. peculiar present, yeah. Another peculiar presentation, very similar to him, but of a different etiology. I've had a five-year-old uh, small girl, or I think she was eight years old from Delhi. Colleague referred her to me. She was the daughter of the uh, the trustee of that hospital. And they were complete anxiety. She used to sublux it every time she flexed her elbow or when she did active movement. The biceps was tight. And the clinically, when we found out, that we asked her to forward flex with the elbow straight and she wouldn't dislocate. She would go through completely. So she had ligament laxity and tight biceps. And when the biceps was recruited, that you gave her something to eat, she would sublux it. Whereas you put her arm straight and you put her and did this. And that was amazing. So all we did was core and scapular restoration. And so it was just one of the triggers. She had antiverted scapula, ligament laxity, weakness. So it's very peculiar. You are, that's why I said, dig deeper, find out the cause. It's very interesting that you shared that case, Vivek. Yeah. Thank you. So any more questions? I'm just going to, uh, again, I'll resume my debate with Ashish about frozen shoulders, which is again, uh, we, we probably differ slightly on our opinions, but maybe that's I'm probably impatient and Ashish is a very stable person and Ashish has got the ingredients for a brilliant recipe and I don't. It's interesting about the role of physio and I totally agree with you that a lot of stiff shoulders are labeled frozen shoulders, but they're not necessarily true frozen shoulders, but they're stiff shoulders. But the whole UK frost trial, which has just concluded yeah. last year and the results are not out as yet, although as a part of the sort of the, the, the group that recruited, I'm aware of the results. But it is very interesting that the, the rehab arm, which was very closely supervised, it was not a it, the pragmatism was thrown out in the uh, rehab where patients were being seen every week by a physiotherapist for 12 weeks successively. That has come out the worst in that group and the intervention group has done much better than the rehab group. The results are gonna come, they're still not being finalized for publication, they're gonna come out. And now is that the, re the you know, I'm just trying to delve into those reasons. Is it because your patients come to you earlier in their phase of their disease? And is it a different disease we are seeing altogether? I would have thought, you know, with the incidence of high incidence of diabetes in India, you would expect more aggressive frozen shoulders. Yes. But yes. you're still able to manage them. Uh, and our mm -hmm. physiotherapy group also yeah. had injections. Okay. So they were given an injection 
and then physio then rehab. You are not using any injections, yeah. whatever phase you're seeing them. So I'm just trying to delve a bit deeper. My understanding is that it starts as an inflammatory process. You catch them early with hydrodilatation or injection, and then you rehab them. You get a successful mm -hmm. outcome. While you are telling me otherwise, and there are others who work in the Indian setup, and it would be nice to get their opinion as well. I think uh, in my no, I'm shocked and gutted to hear this, Kapil because my uh, literature that I have is complete tells me opposite. I just need one input from you. What was the criteria for diagnosing frozen shoulder or intervention? So the definition, so the definition of frozen shoulder was if they've got loss of external rotation and abduction less than 50% of the opposite side, which is true glenohumeral abduction, Normal x-rays, we don't do MR scans or any other imaging for our suspected frozen shoulders. Only thing they get is a plain x-ray. And once you had died, and they had, had symptoms for at least three months, then they were randomized into three, uh, uh, we were randomizing into, into arms. three arms. So uh, the either they were for non-operative, which was in, injection depending on the surgeon's preference and physiotherapy for 12 weeks, or they were, uh, uh, randomized to MUA uh, an injection or uh, capsular release. So the surgical uh, arm has done better than the rehab arm. There is not a significant difference between the capsular release and the MUA. So they might come out similar, but the intervention arm has done better than the rehab arm. As okay. I said, these are unpublished results. But, but uh, Kapil, so but, in your conservative group, all of them were given injections. They were not treated just by rehab. You know, as I say, it was it was up to the surgeon's preference. So, whether you give an injection, whether you give an image guided injection, whether you give them a blind injection, but the, the key was the rehab. And was the uh, physiotherapy regime was uh, followed compliant? Because it might be difficult sometimes to get uh, that much regular physiotherapy in UK. No, settings. no, no. So, they were coming every week. They were coming so every week. week. For okay. the study group, they were all coming. Once a week for twelve weeks. That was the if they were out of area or did not did not have access to twelve weeks of rehab, then they were not include. They were that was not offered. Be very interesting to note. This will maybe if the results come out, this will be the first ever trial from UK that is favoring operative treatment. I think that is why the results are not being published. No. Ram, I did not say yeah. that <laughs> because I can give you at least four studies. One the largest is the Swedish study, two hundred patients, both arms. They did a home program versus a manipulation on anesthesia, and even the home program patient did well. For me, our uh, cutoff point for true frozen shoulder is 20 degrees. Our degree experience with close, they will rehabilitate them. I used to be fairly, I wouldn't say aggressive, but my threshold for operating was very low previously, and I'm talking 12 years back. I realized there were at least three patients who had done very well and they worshipped me for that. They came back with the same problem five years later and they were refusing to undergo rehabilitation. They said, do the surgery, it worked last time. And surgeons as they are, you know, this fairly heliocentric approach. Uh, I am the final and went in and did the same surgery and probably much better skill after five years. And they didn't do well at all. And that's got me thinking. And since then we stepped back and I do that, but very infrequently. So our threshold is 20 degrees. And 20 degrees, my therapists are, find it very difficult to stretch them out. And when you have one-sided tight muscle like a subscap and rotator interval, the contralateral muscles pronus in, cannot fire, although it's normal. And then they cannot restore the normalcy. So we have started doing a high volume injection. That's intervention, but it's extra articular. It's a 20 cc normal saline injected without steroid ultrasound guided in the CHL. That paper got the gold medal at the Calicut IAS. And so we have got reasonable good results, but it's used as an adjunct. They go back to the same uh, exercise program. We are writing that up, double blind, randomized, two control groups randomized properly, undergoing the same rehab. Only one group undergoes the injection and the other doesn't. And there are slightly better results with that. But I don't see a challenge with 40 degrees external rotation at all. Vivek had a point to make, I think. Vivek, yes. you were going to say something? I think uh, I, I have always uh, taken in this a very traditional approach. So I usually, as uh, 
um, somewhere in between what Kapil sir and Ashish are saying. So I usually start them with my first course of an essay um, for about 10 days in the night, one tablet. And I just ask them to do what they want, you know, whichever phase they come, especially if they are talking about the freezing and the frozen phases. But if they fail to respond, I am absolutely, you know, fine giving one shot imaging guided intra-articular injection, about 80 milligram of tricot. And uh, Ashish, you very rightly said, see, it is never alone the steroid. That is one very right point you made. If you leave these patients just on steroid forever, that's the wrong thing. So they go home again yeah. and they come back at 10 days when the pain and inflammation has subsided. And then we put them on rehab program. And over the years, probably last uh, five years, I have also been doing hardly one or two releases a year. Um, <clears throat> but what Kapil sir said also, actually the literature is a bit in more favor. Lone physio, overall, if you compile the entire literature, lone physio is not a very great idea. Majority of the centers across the globe, they do couple either with a analgesic course or often they give one shot of a steroid injection. Um, but if you start comparing at the end of one year, what happens? Yeah, at the end of one year, they may do fine. But uh, my personal thing is those who suffer from pain every night, every night, day by day and day and night, it's, it's, it's terrible. So I think it may be a good idea to give a steroid injection, but do couple with physiotherapy after 15 to 20 days once the pain is subsided. I think the key is pain control followed by regular... Followed by rehab. Followed by rehab. You have to be persistent in saying to the patient that you will get better, go. It's very difficult yes. to manage the patient with the non-operative for frozen shoulder, but you have to be persistent, uh, reassuring. And then Kapil, yeah. one pearl from my That's side. Uh, the game changer is infraspinatus. So if after a given program, two weeks in my head, or maybe three weeks in England after doing one week every session, if before starting the infra was weak, and after completing two to three weeks, their infra is strong. They're the ones that are going to do well. If the infra is still weak after two to three weeks, it is disingenuous to continue the program. It is not going to work. That's fine. That's a good one. I'll, I'll, I'll set up a little study from now on and we'll, we'll I, I like your infra, I, I, you know, for what I'm getting from you is that you think infra is the source of all evil. From tennis elbow yes. to frozen shoulder yes. to everything else. That's uh, mm -hmm. that's my next clinic. Seriously. I'll be doing that whenever I get permission to see more yeah. patients. <laughs> Please remember to send a check by post. Oh, absolutely. The check for my JSES subscription. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Any more comments? I think we have. Uh, uh, Thank you. Ended our uh, webinar for 30, 35 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ashish, uh, Mansi, thank you, Kapil, Shashong, Vivek, and Ashok as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, we will conclude this. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. Good day. Thank you. Loved it.